afternoon. Glad to have you folks here. Glad to be able to be here to do something we haven't been able to do at the center for a little while. I think due to the efforts of all the folks and the whole shuttle team, at least we got one in the air. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to the commander of this mission, Captain Dick Richards. Thank you, PJ. Can you hear me in the back? Yes, okay. Well, thanks for uh, showing your support and interest uh, by coming out here this afternoon. We put together about a 20-minute videotape, which are highlights of the things that we all did on uh, SDS-41. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, my crewmen. I was very fortunate and uh, to uh, have a great set of people on this particular flight. Uh, we've been asked to comment about uh, what makes a successful flight, and uh, if you put uh, good people like we have in this room, and at this uh, center, together with uh, good hardware, it really gets easy, and it's, it's, a, it's a great uh, great thing that we do here. We, we launched on time. We've done that before in the past. I knew we could do it, and uh, we did it, and we're going to continue doing those sort of things. But let me introduce my crew. Uh, immediately to my left, uh, a, uh, one of our first-time flyers and my pilot, very fortunate to have on this flight, a Marine Lieutenant Colonel Robert Cabana. <clears throat> And they keep uh, changing the order of sequence here to see if I uh, mess this up here. But uh, in the middle, uh, another first-time flyer uh, just reported here in 1987 uh, and uh, spent three years here and got an opportunity to fly in space. Uh, the first U.S. Coast Guardsman ever to uh, fly in space, uh, Commander Bruce Melnick. Next to him, uh, our other experienced mission specialist, he was the bosun's mate on our flight. If, for those of you who are not in the Navy that don't know what a bosun's mate is, the bosun mate is the one that, uh, that keeps good order in the ship. And uh, Sh Bill Shepard did that, a Navy captain, flew on STS-27, and I can't tell you how invaluable he was, uh, not only to me, but uh, to the other rookies, uh, providing us uh, with the right words at the right time on uh, what to do and during those four days. Captain Bill Shepard. And lastly, uh, all the way to the end, uh, but certainly not least, uh, Bill Shepard referred to him uh, in our welcome home ceremony at uh, Ellington as our secret weapon. And that's, uh, and I, I'll second that. Uh, Tom Akers, a real quiet individual, but I assigned him the responsibility of uh, getting uh, Ulysses out on time, and he did that. Uh, those of you who worked with him know that uh, a tremendous individual and uh, really was a contributor and was absolutely essential to making the success of STS uh, 41 happen for us. Not a bad uh, job for your first flight, Major Tom Akers. <clears throat> and uh, without any further ado here, if we can get the lights down and uh, we'll roll this videotape, we'll try to narrate you through some of the highlights for STS-41. Well, uh, here we are. Uh, we were pretty happy at this point because uh, no flight crew had made it uh, this far, at least being able to walk out to the Astrovan in about six months, so we felt pretty good. I had left word uh, overnight uh, that if, uh, if we had uh, had anything to wake me up and I had a nice sound sleep, so I was optimistic when we got up, particularly when we got out the launch pad and saw the weather. Bob will describe a little bit about what it's like to fly in the shuttle for the first time and have an ascent. Well, as pretty as a uh, day as we had for everyone watching, uh, and as nice a view as it was, and let me tell you, it was uh, from a first-time flyer's point of view, it was even more spectacular inside. Uh, the Cape provided us with a, uh, a super vehicle in Discovery, and she performed flawlessly. It was uh, an extremely smooth ride uphill, uh, especially once we got off the uh, solid rocket motors. It was just a nice, uh, steady acceleration out to Miko, and uh, really surprised me how smooth the ride was. As you can see from our, our smoke trail uh, going uphill here, there's uh, very little wind shear. It was just an absolutely uh, super day and uh, a super day to start an absolutely great mission. During the uh, launch count, uh, it was uh, absolutely almost identical to the one I had uh, about a year ago. The, uh, everything was nominal. Uh, all the calls were as expected, and uh, we had a real clean uh, vehicle. The only thing we were concerned with the last few minutes was a couple of unplanned holes that uh, we, were, we could tell would probably uh, be, uh, we'd be able to get uh, get past those and uh, the launch count proceeded. Then we had one cloud in the area that held us and I think we were 
I think we're about five to ten minutes late uh, from our planned takeoff time, but well uh, before the end of our launch period. At about an hour and a half uh, after launch, uh, Bruce opened the payload bay doors, as you see here, and he and I began the uh, checkout of the uh, upper stage booster system that was going to put Ulysses on its way to Jupiter and then ultimately the sun. As you can see in that picture, we have an extremely clean payload bay, and that was true also in the crew compartment. The folks down at uh, KSC did a great job on this vehicle. The checkout uh, comprised the next three or four hours looking for about a six-hour deploy of Ulysses, and in that time we checked out the upper stage booster system, the crew interfaces with that, prepared to uh, activate the tilt table that would raise it to 60 degrees for deploy. Uh, Bob, our pilot, maneuvered the orbiter to several different attitudes to provide the ground with uh, the corrections they needed to give the upper stage system a precise attitude correction. Here you see the deploy, and as the upper stage and Ulysses are pushed out of the payload bay at about uh, four to five inches per second, you'll see in a moment uh, in the background there things that look like uh, particles or stars flying back behind the vehicle, and those were just ice particles that continued to uh, come off of the orbiter for the first several hours that first day and was really a spectacular show. At about a minute after deploy here, which again occurred at uh, six hours and about a minute mission elapsed time, after one minute, uh, Dick did a minus X or a back off maneuver where we backed away from the uh, spacecraft, which gave us about two and a half feet per second separation. As you can see, we deployed in darkness. And you'll see in a minute when the spacecraft comes into the sunlight, it was really, a, again, a very spectacular show. After 15 minutes from deploy, we did an ohm separation maneuver that ultimately placed us uh, above and behind the spacecraft at about 40 miles separation. You'll see here in a moment uh, the curved object you've probably heard about that uh, appeared in the, the screen the first time we had noticed it. And they're still investigating as to what that possibly is. They think it's uh, ice of some sort that came from the rear of the vehicle and don't think it uh, came from anything associated with uh, the spacecraft or with the deploy. There you see that object coming into view. This was essentially, in my view, uh, looking out through the overhead window. And uh, during the deploy sequence, uh, I didn't even see this object. And it was, wasn't until after we uh, replayed the videotape that uh, we finally picked it up. And then again, as I mentioned, at about uh, 65 minutes after deploy, we went into a window protect attitude so we could no longer see the, the spacecraft. And of course, it was a long ways off by then also. And the first uh, solid rocket burn of the upper stage occurred and uh, was exactly as they expected it to be. And then the second stage, and then finally the third stage, uh, the PAM-S solid rocket motor burn. And after about uh, 16 or 17 minutes after that first burn, the folks on the ground started looking for Ulysses data and found it, the Ulysses exactly where they expected it to be. So it was a almost as precise, in fact, a little more precise than anybody on the ground had expected the three burns to be. And as of today, uh, Ulysses is over six and a half million miles away and doing much better than expected. Tom and I uh, cranked up the uh, remote arm on the first part of day two and put it in this ram position you see here uh, in part to support the uh, space station, but mainly to provide some data on the Intelsat solar array erosion that uh, has been estimated. This is a shot of the activation of the SSBUV, or the Shuttle Solar Backscatter Ultraviolet Experiment. It's uh, a major secondary payload that we carried in the payload bay. Uh, here it is, it flies in a gas can, a getaway special, and the SSBUV is going to be used to calibrate the NASA uh, Nimbus satellites and the NOAA Tyro satellites, which are presently orbiting the Earth, measuring the uh, ozone layer. It does this by comparing the radiation that's emitted 
from the sun with the radiation that's backscattered uh, from the earth. The ozone absorbs the radiation and therefore they can measure how much of the uh, radiation is being absorbed and can get a grasp on how much uh, ozone there is in the atmosphere. This is a, a shot of us uh, getting ready to activate the SSCE or the Solid Surface Combustion Experiment which you've probably heard about our fire in space. The uh, data from this fire in this enclosed uh, container was recorded on uh, t with two cameras, a 16 millimeter uh, film. And as a backup, Shep came up with the neat idea of using our fiber scope to put down in front of the one of the windows and record it on board our, uh, one of our onboard cameras and TV in the vehicle. And this is a, a recording of that that we downlinked uh, subsequently of one of the two views of the flame. Of course, the intent of the experiment was to evaluate the characteristics of flame spread uh, in the absence of buoyant convection or in microgravity. We did this by in igniting a small piece of paper in this container and then just letting it burn and photographing what happened with those cameras. The experiment's going to fly seven more times uh, with varying fuels, uh, oxygen concentration, and pressure in the container. And of course, the application is going to hopefully improve our fire safety aspects of spaceflight. This is a shot of activating the IPMP, or the Investigations into Polymer Membrane uh, Processing. SDS-41 uh, was, although it was a short flight, only four days in length, uh, was the uh, first flight to start uh, medical uh, uh, tests uh, for uh, future extended duration orbiter flights uh, when, we, when we attempt to fly for uh, in the 15 to 20 day time frame. And even though we had such a short flight, there was, of course, they want to anchor their database with, uh, with the low end as well as the high end. This is, uh, I'm hanging on top of the escape pole there and, uh, and Tom is wiring me up with a blood pressure cuff device, which we wore, Tom and I wore for about 48 hours uh, on the ship and slept with it as well too and uh, <clears throat> and uh, hopefully give them some good data about how the heart adjusts uh, to uh, the uh, sudden onset of uh, zero gravity. This is a plug for my uh, alma mater. They sent me at the last minute, sent me a sweatshirt, which uh, turned out to work pretty good to uh, contain all of this uh, extraneous hardware on this particular medical experiment. Here, Chef and I are uh, participating in DSO uh, 472 and 474. It's uh, retinal photography and also uh, measuring his interocular pressure. We did this uh, three times on orbit to uh, document fluid shift in the body and uh, see if there was any correlation to SAS. We all got a chance on board to work with uh, three different types of laptops, and we also had the first orbital floppy disk here. And we're looking at uh, various kinds of displays and also uh, cursor control devices. Here's one called a Felix that will take the place of a trackball and may have some application uh, down the road in space station. That previous sequence there was the one, uh, a lot of us, a lot of times we get accused of uh, doing this in a hangar someplace in Texas. And so that last sequence with the disk was our proof that this was on board the uh, orbiter in, uh, in a micro G environment. No, uh, no flight uh, crew movie can be complete without uh, somebody being filmed playing with their food. And then in, the, in this case, uh, it was me who got caught uh, by Shep up their uh, set of uh, canned peaches that uh, I had a lot of good time with. Tom mentioned that uh, the Cape provided us with a, with a very clean vehicle. It, I thought Columbia was clean on my previous flight, but this one was even better. We found very few uh, extraneous objects, a total maybe of three that we put in our things found in discovery bag. And uh, we, we, worked, uh, we worked very hard to, uh, to uh, try to maintain, uh, maintain the cleanliness of the orbiter. And you see Tom uh, tucking away his uh, drink container and also gave him an opportunity to uh, plug this uh, place in Missouri, and he can talk about that. Yeah, this is an advertisement for my hometown, Eminence, Missouri. And of course, the Red Wings are the uh, high school athletic mascot. Another uh, important aspect of the flight was the uh, time that we spent observing the Earth beneath us. Uh, 
as you know, we use a variety of cameras to document changes in the Earth's environment. Uh, we saw a number of them. Here we are coming up over the uh, Tibesti Mountains in northern Chad in Africa. This is a, an active volcanic region on the Earth. Uh, we noticed a lot of fires throughout Africa and South America uh, and changes in the uh, levels of lakes and also uh, different volcanic areas. Well, being in the Coast Guard, the only time they let me take pictures of the ocean was when we were over shallow water. And uh, here we are over the Arabian Sea, just off Somalia. And if you look close in the middle, you'll see a ship's wake in the sun glint. We also observed several other oceanographic phenomena that are really only visible from the Earth orbit, such as uh, the Sulois, the, the ocean waves, and also some spiral eddies. And we got to get a good look at some of those things while we were up there looking at the ocean uh, in the sun glint. Also took some other uh, Earth OBS photos and other land masses. We crossed uh, Central America and South America quite uh, often up there and a lot during our awake cycle. And also we covered Australia quite a few times. Here's a view going over Shark Bay and looking into the Shark Bay on Western Australia. And then we jumped to a, a scene in the central area of Australia in the Lake Eyre area. The Lake Eyre area is very important to observe from space because of the uh, different amounts of rainfall it gets really determines how much uh, water there are in the different watershed areas. As we've already talked about, we have very many cameras that, that we use in the orbiter, and the next clip coming up is a demonstration of how we might be able to more automate how we use the cameras on the space shuttles, in specific the uh, TV cameras. For the last several days in space, and we thought you'd like to look, see how it's been working for us. George Salazar and his crew down there at the Johnson Space Center have put together a system that allows us to control the cameras without using our hands. We can just use voice commands to talk to the cameras. So here's a quick demonstration on how they work. Voice command, activate. Would you like to monitor for the camera? TV1, Delta. Action. Action. Right. Stop. Tilt up. Left. Stop. Right. Stop. Change rate. Tilt down. Stop. Change rate. Tilt down. Stop. Right. Stop. Too much. Too much. Too much. Zoom in. As you can see, it's a great system, and we really like it. At the end, on day four, uh, one, of the th one of the things you have to do is get ready to come home. And uh, we, uh, we, Bob and I started off uh, the process by doing uh, the uh, FCS checkout of flight control system, the uh, orbiter AP. We, Bob cranked up one of our three uh, auxiliary power units to provide hydraulic pressure out to our control surfaces. And uh, just like any airplane uh, you have out at Ellington or Hobby, uh, one thing that the pilots do before they go flying is uh, wipe out the flight control system and move the control surfaces around. And uh, we do that just by letting the uh, computers do that. Everything was uh, extremely nominal and uh, told us uh, that uh, we probably could expect a smooth entry. <clears throat> the evening before we deorbited, uh, Tom Bruce and I stowed the arm after having the Intel set array out in the flow for a little over a day and a half. And all the arm ops were completely nominal. Uh, we couldn't resist putting at least one orbiter sunset uh, that we saw of the 60 or so that we did see. Here we are uh, with one of our long-range tracking cameras uh, coming in. Uh, we had a calm, beautiful day out there at Edwards, just like we expected. And uh, for myself, the first time I've ever flown this uh, vehicle for real, uh, it matched very closely uh, with uh, our shuttle training airplanes that we have out here at Ellington Field and 
uh, the fact that I had done this uh, about a thousand times prior in our shuttle turning airplane, it felt very at ease with the orbiter uh, coming into Edwards uh, Air Force Base, landing on the concrete runway out there, uh, runway 22. This uh, test, uh, we did have a test of the, uh, the carbon brake system on this particular flight. Uh, for those, most, some of you may know, uh, we've got a new braking system here. Uh, and this was the second flight of it, and our objective was to uh, put a moderate amount of energy into the brakes. And uh, this is a series of three flight tests, uh, of which after the third one, the carbon brake system will be uh, cleared for uh, nominal end emission usage. And appropriately, having the sun go through uh, with the Ulysses project there, the landing rollout, we thought that was an appropriate thing to conclude also. The braking system very, very smooth to me, and uh, the orbiter re responded uh, just like it did in flight uh, exactly uh, to my expectations. It was a 15,000-foot runway, and we landed about 2,300 feet down the runway with about a 9,000-foot roll-up. And uh, as I turned to my crew just before we walked out of the white room, they performed perfectly, in my opinion, for four days, and I said, this is the last time you guys can mess up and fall down the stairs. <laughs> and as you can see, they uh, did, uh, did that just as equally well as they did everything else uh, for the previous four days and the previous uh, nine months here that we've been together. A great flight.